Coming up on Market to Market, summer storms continue to hammer the country from the plains to the coast. The potential for record crops and a mixed ending stocks report increase market volatility. And federal officials, scientists, and farmers band together to fight a virus hitting the hog barn. Those stories and market analysis with Darren Newsom next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, July 11 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. U.S. consumers have gone deeper in debt as they ramped up investments in big-ticket items like houses, automobiles, and education. According to the Federal Reserve, an increase in loans for cars and college pushed consumer credit to $3.19 trillion, driving June's consumer debt 7.4 percent higher than May on an annualized basis. The Commerce Department revealed this week that wholesale inventories rose one-half of one percent in May, the weakest pace in five months. A week after consumers paid the highest 4th of July gas prices since 2008, the average cost of a gallon of fuel fell nearly three cents to $3.63. And stocks suffered their biggest weekly loss since April after the market assessed corporate news and the European debt crisis. This summer's weather has been a story of extremes. Drought in the western U.S. is expected to deplete Lake Mead to levels not seen since the Hoover Dam was completed in 1937. Wildfires continue to burn out west where nearly 700,000 acres have already been consumed this year. And record drought levels in California's fertile Central Valley have increased by more than 50 percent in the last quarter. However, much of the drought appears to be over in the Corn Belt, where summer storms spent another week hammering the countryside. Add 2014 to the list of years with major flooding along the Mississippi River. The July 4th holiday weekend was washed out along the Davenport-Iowa riverfront. This year's crest was near 21 feet, 6 feet above flood stage, but 2 feet shy of the record set in 1993. Just south of the Quad Cities, in Burlington, this year's crest was the third worst on record and was the fourth worst in Keokuk, Iowa. Iowa experienced its fourth wettest June in 141 years. Davenport is one of the largest cities along the Mississippi River without permanent flood protection in place. Downstream, near Hannibal, Missouri, the Mississippi reached major flood levels. The home of Mark Twain was inundated with water around landmarks, riverfront, and businesses. Two Mississippi River bridges were closed, one at Quincy, Illinois, the other at Louisiana, Missouri. The second closure resulted in a detour of roughly 70 miles to get over the waterway. River traffic has ground to a halt between Muscatine, Iowa, and Clarksville, Missouri, just north of St. Louis, because of the high water. The river has crested in many of these locations and is slowly headed back down, but the level will remain high for weeks to come, unless more storms worsen the situation. Iowa was also the target of a large tornado outbreak this week. Four different twisters damaged several farmsteads around the northeast town of Rhinebeck. Other damage was sustained to the trees and buildings in a path almost seven miles long, but the twisters avoided populated areas. No injuries were reported in the Hawkeye State, but the same could not be said in the Empire State. Violent weather rolled through central New York this week. Four people died after the serious storms hit between the Syracuse and Utica areas in Smithfield. At least four homes were destroyed and more than 55,000 were without power. It was like a white wall of rain with huge winds and uh, it sounded like the sound of a jet engine rumbling. At that point, we took our two boys down in the uh, lower part of the house under the stairwell, and as quick as it came, it was over. 
The fast-moving storms also did damage in Maryland, where a child at a summer camp was killed by a falling tree. Three small tornadoes touched down in Ohio, and at least one other was sighted in Pennsylvania, where more than 300,000 lost power at the peak of the summer storm. In a sign that winter is almost over, this is all that's left of a snow pile in Austin, Minnesota. The parking lot in the southern portion of the land of 10,000 lakes is home to the remnants of a season that seemed to linger far too long. Earlier this week, the last snow mound left in Superior, Wisconsin melted, thus ending the local Chamber of Commerce's Snowpocalypse Contest. Despite the inclement weather, the nation's corn and soybean crops are striding towards a record year. USDA's latest crop condition report reveals 75% of the corn is in good to excellent condition. Corn silking is just shy of the five-year average at 15%. Soybeans are in a similar boat, with 72% of the crop listed as good to excellent by USDA. And blooming is slightly ahead of the five-year average at 24%. The winter wheat harvest is still slightly behind the five-year pace. As of this week, 57% of the crop is in the bin. An outbreak of porcine epidemic diarrhea, or PED, has swept across the United States. The disease, which has a high mortality rate in piglets less than a week old, was noticed last year in just a few barns. Over the past 12 months, the number of infected facilities has mushroomed by more than 4,000%. The potential cost to farmers and related support industries remains undetermined, but if left unchecked, could push pork prices even higher than what they are today. The influx of the disease into the U.S. remains a mystery, but federal officials agree it spreads easily. After a delayed response, USDA officials are moving forward with new reporting requirements. But even though the number of animals infected by PED and other related viruses appears to be declining, experts are quick to say it's not time to relax. Paul Yeager explains. USDA officials will begin enforcing a new order requiring farmers to report new or renewed outbreaks of porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, or PED, and to related viruses. The outbreak of the disease, which has a high mortality rate for piglets less than a week old, continues to move through barns across the nation. At the end of the day, this is really about saying, look, a year ago we were talking about 103 barns and operations. Today we're talking about 4,700. Uh, a year ago there weren't too many countries in the world that were saying we don't want any live pork exports. Today there are a few. Uh, we have a five, an over a five and a half billion dollar export market for pork. Why would we want to jeopardize that? The federal order requires that producers who have hogs testing positive for PED, a variant of PED or porcine Delta coronavirus, report those results to a state or federal veterinarian. The vets will help direct farmers on how to improve biosecurity and create a federally required disease management plan. To help defer some of the related expenses, USDA has cost-sharing funds available. Farmers who deliberately ignore the federal order could be fined or face limitations on where they can move their hogs. Federal officials and private pork industry spokespeople joined Secretary of Agriculture Vilsack for the unveiling of the new rule at last month's World Pork Expo. We've tried to find the right balance on that issue of heavy-handedness. Uh, as I pointed out, there's no movement restriction here. There's no quarantine requirement. This is a reporting requirement, a notification requirement, and in the long-term best interest of the operator and their and the industry. I know confidentiality is a concern for you all, but I cannot do my job without good, solid data. According to USDA, the percentage of positive tests for PED and its variant continue to decline. In November of last year, 38% of the barns tested came back with positive results. By June of this year, that number had declined to 14%. We think that that's probably due to the warmer weather. Uh, although we don't want 100 degree days, the virus hates them just as much as we do. But 
don't uh, let your guard down. Our veterinarians are telling producers it's not time to uh, really compromise your biosecurity. Now is the time to leverage the heat to try to tamp down the virus and get ready for next fall. Last month, the federal government granted conditional approval for a new vaccine created by Harris Vaccines of Ames, Iowa. The drug is designed to improve sow immunity to PED, ideally passing antibodies to piglets through the sow's milk. Newborn piglets are most likely to die from PED as they rapidly dehydrate once infected. Harris Vaccines officials say a small test, although not statistically significant, showed that vaccinated sows lost 15% of their piglets compared to 42% in the non-vaccinated control group. The company is working on a larger study. Federal officials say other companies also are working on vaccines for PED. Humans are not susceptible to the virus, which doesn't present a food safety issue. However, the U.S. hog supply as of June 1 was down 5% compared to a year ago, though experts had expected a 10% drop. A total of 30 states have now reported infections. Jackson, Minnesota-based New Fashion Pork, which markets 1.2 million hogs annually, is among the thousands of pork producers who have lost large numbers of piglets due to PED and Delta coronavirus. About half of the sows in Minnesota have been affected by it, and I would say those numbers hold pretty, pretty true to our system too. Um, and yeah, we've definitely incorporated some new biosecurity protocols and how we handle people coming onto our site, including our trucks and our truck drivers. So there's been several changes within our system, but they've made us better. Erickson, animal well-being and quality assurance manager for New Fashion Pork, says the company dealt with a PED outbreak in the fall of 2013 and an outbreak of the related Delta coronavirus in the spring of 2014. Its Glidden, Iowa sow barns were clear of the virus in June, but the producers have been unable to eliminate the virus from nursery barns. These pigs were weaned today from the sow farm, so they've just been placed this morning. That's why they're all tuckered out and laying out about right now. These pigs are actually getting infected upon arrival. So I would say probably by, let's see, today is Thursday, probably by tomorrow morning, tomorrow evening, we'll start seeing signs and symptoms of PED in these pigs because there's lots of nooks and crannies in the barn, whether it's the water cup, the feeder, uh, the rotechnas, the nose-to-nose -nose contact. So. We know that these sites are still dirty and they still have PED in them. So it just takes a matter of hours for that pig to be, come in contact with that disease and start infecting the entire herd. USDA officials believe mandatory reporting should provide more immediate data to allow for faster, more informed decisions. When the outbreak began last year, federal officials said they lacked the data needed to make effective decisions to protect the U.S. hog herd. I want us to build a model together so that when the next PED comes into this country or whatever the soup de jour it is, that we act together and we act quickly. And we don't wait to see whether the disease is going to cause approximately 7 million dead baby pigs. The thing about federal reporting is that, you know what, there's still going to be some farmers that choose not to or don't participate in it. And it's unfortunate because it's nice for, you know, it's being a good neighbor to let people know when you have that disease. Um, we knew in this area to, that we're at today when our neighbors went positive, you know, they were forthcoming with that information and that's what it's really all about is, is just being a good neighbor with it. So far, the financial impact of the disease has, for most producers, been largely offset by the increased pork prices that resulted from anticipated supply shortages. But few expect this to continue if the disease spreads quickly once colder weather returns. What keeps me up at night is what's the next thing that might come through this same pathway or pathways. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. Next, the Market to Market Report. 
Despite bad weather throughout the grain belt, the potential for record large corn and soybean crops and higher ending stocks pressured grain prices lower. For the week, September wheat lost 54 cents, while the nearby corn contract moved 32 cents lower. Friday's USDA report revealed more than adequate soybean stocks, which pressured the August contract downward by a dollar and four cents. Nearby meal prices followed suit with a loss of $29.90 per ton. In the softs, cotton continued its third week of declines as the December contract gave up $3.94 per hundredweight. In the dairy market, August class, class 3 milk gained 12 cents, while the deferred contract gave up 43. Over in livestock, prices fell back from last week's records as the August cattle contract lost $5.88. August feeders declined $7 and a quarter, and the August lean hog contract was $2.93 lower. In the financials, the euro held relatively even, gaining less than one basis point against the dollar. Crude oil declined $3.10 per barrel. Comex Gold gained $16.80 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index lost nearly 20 points to settle at $6.31.60. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Darren Newsom. Darren, welcome back. Good to be back, Mike. We had the USDA report out today. <laughs> yes, we We'll did. cover that in pieces <laughs> as we get to each commodity. Let's break into it with the wheat market. Okay. Any big news? Well, we can start with wheat because there was nothing in the in this report uh, that's going to change the direction or the mood of the wheat market. Uh, I hate to always be bearish wheat, but what we saw, larger projections or projections of larger domestic and global ending stocks, uh, U.S. domestic, or excuse, sorry, domestic ending stocks to use, now pegged at something like 31.7%, so almost a third uh, of total demand left over in stocks when all said and done. Hugely bearish situation, certainly easily readable on what we've seen in the September, December spread. Uh, the carry moving out to about 24, 25 cents. So market has not changed its tone for quite some time. Uh, it's still going to struggle. There's just simply still too much wheat worldwide. Any chance we're getting close to a harvest low or does that uh, overhang a wheat you know, push the, us farther down? Yeah, the biggest thing with wheat, and we'll talk about this with other commodities as well, is that it's oversold right now. But we get into these situations where fundamentals outweigh possibly you know, non-commercial wanting to get out of a, of a short position. It doesn't really matter if it's oversold, doesn't matter if it's low priced or maybe undervalued. They want to keep pressing the market lower because there's just no fundamental reason for it to rally. Can we say the low is in? Wheat's one of those that likes to surprise by, by putting spikes in. I just haven't seen any indication that it's there yet. All right, so maybe hold on. Yeah. See if we get a spike and then sell it. it I, was, like. I was asked today if today was the day to sell wheat, and this was before the report came out. What do you do? I mean, if you're still holding wheat, it is a tough call. Uh, but m you would think that at some point we would be able to rally out of this hole, even if not just a little bit for just a little bit. All right. Well, let's jump on over. Let's look at the corn market. Okay. Uh, we did have some corn news mm -hmm. today. Let's break down the USDA supply and demand report on corn. Uh, the biggest, again, as with wheat, both domestic and global ending stocks were increased for old crop and new crop. Uh, the biggest news to me, uh, they, they did leave, uh, USDA did leave uh, the uh, the new crop production alone, as expected. Uh, the acres were from the June 30th report. Yield isn't going to change this time around. They'll probably move it uh, in the August when they have their actual survey numbers. So the production side was basically left unchanged. Total supplies did increase because old crop ending stocks edged higher. We saw a little bit of a reduction in uh, in feed demand. That backed off a little bit. They left exports at 1.9 billion. This They came in at 1.246 billion bushels ending stocks, which is pretty close to what their June 30th quarterly stocks report implied with average fourth quarter demand that corn stocks would be. So, you know, we were looking for a bit of an increase. Actually, I, I think at some point we're still going to get closer to that 1.3 billion bushels, carry that forward into the new year. Now, all of a sudden, when we do see USDA change its yield estimate, most likely in August, and they bump it up from the 165.3, maybe 167, 168, we're dealing with a crop of 14 billion bushels. We're dealing with total supplies of over 15. And the most alarming thing to me in the corn report today was the fact that we've now trimmed 200 million bushels from demand year to year, from 1314 to 1415. So we've got building supplies, demand coming down. This is not a recipe for a continued bullish market. Make sales 
Monday. Is that be <laughs> you I mean, know, time to time to get in there before these big yield numbers start to change? Uh, you know, I think what we 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 have to see, you know how the market's going to react. We, we saw the market come under pressure today and then it trimmed its loss a little bit. So, you know, like wheat, corn is sharply oversold and desperately in need of a rally to take some of this, you know, some of this bearishness out of it. But when it does, it's going to be a market that everyone's looking to sell because everyone's waiting for that August report. Now they've got it penciled in. That's when this thing's really going to get hammered next. So between now and then could be an opportunity to get some sales on. All right. Well, let's jump over to soybeans. A big move down in the nearby contract. We have a lot of beans. Talk to us about what we learned today. Number one, we don't have a lot of beans. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I don't say that, it, no disrespect in that whatsoever. But the misconception today was that this old crop number was bearish when they raised ending stocks from 125 million bushels to 140 million bushels. The USDA did that by increasing demand by 50 million bushels and decreasing imports by 5 million bushels. What happened was they took residual use, this catch-all category, which has no explanation and no definition, is kind of a wild card. We knew it was coming at some point, and July seemed to be the obvious case, again, before the survey comes out on, in August. But they took it down to a negative 70 million bushels, completely erasing the increase in demand and what would have pulled ending stocks down below 100 million bushels by adding that 70 million bushels on and taking residual use into the, into the negative territory, we created a situation where it looks like we have more ending stocks now of 140 million bushels. That's fine, but let's look at ending stocks to use. It is still a record tight 4.1%. We've never seen this situation before. And that's because we did see that overall increase in the other demand, in, in crush demand, in export demand. So we've, get, we've still got a very tight situation in old crop soybeans. The problem is we're at that point of the year where nobody cares anymore. It's all weather, it's all new crop. But you know, as we look to see what happens now in the new crop market, do not be surprised as the next marketing year comes along that somewhere along the line those 70 million bushels start to get whittled back out of the new crop because they simply don't exist. The, you know, maybe the, maybe the old crop production gets adjusted at some point to probably bring residual use back close to zero, but I think it's going to happen in the new crop market. You're going to see some adjustments made because we are at a projected more comfortable level of something like 415 million bushels for new crop wiggle room to take that 70 million bushel back out once we get into the 14, 15 marketing year. All right. Well, let's jump over to the livestock market mm -hmm. where we, we saw another pullback again this week. Mm -hmm. The fat cattle trade dropped lower pretty, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit today, a little mm -hmm. bit on Friday. Where do you see us coming in this next week? <laughs> it's a, uh, you go anywhere. Uh, I mean, this market, it, it shot up so fast, so high that it left nothing underneath it. It's what I like to call a vacuum market. And so when you start to get into a situation where the buyers step out or they just take a break and they maybe pocket some of the gains that they've had over these last number of weeks, you have nothing, you have no fresh buying to come back down to. So this is where you really have to lean on the cash market. Cash market's going to have to stay strong. If we start to see some problems in basis, if we start to see the cash market weakening in, in uh, relation to the futures, this whole thing could come tumbling down quickly because again, there's just nothing underneath it. Uh, initially I had targeted, you know, after doing some work on the long-term charts, maybe that 160 area would seem to have patterns fitting, you know, go looking back at the charts and possibly projecting ahead. We didn't quite get there. Got up to the 156, 158, something like that, and now it's backed off. We've created some bearish uh, technical signals on the weekly charts. Those have been ignored uh, here over this run. So whether or not the top's actually in, not going to be on the book saying it's the first one. But we have to keep an eye out for these warning signs, the number one being this, this basis, uh, if there's any basis change in the coming weeks. All right. And now we did see a, a sizable pullback in the feeder cattle market mm -hmm. here towards the end of this week, and then it rallied mm -hmm. on Friday. Just on the corn falling? I think, I think the early move, or the early move, the 11 to 12 o'clock move into corn when it was posting double-digit losses certainly sparked some buying interest back in, in the feeder cattle market. But again, we are still dealing with a tight supply and demand situation, feeder cattle, live cattle. So that's helping to provide support. When we see these sell-offs, particularly in a lightly traded con uh, market like feeder cattle, 
a few buy orders coming in late in the week is going to be able to bump, you know, erase some of the losses. So what's important is how this market reacts next week. If we continue to see some pressure, uh, if again, like with live cattle, the, the cash market starts to sag a little bit, then I think we're going to have to start paying some more attention to maybe this market's getting ready to break right now. Not really indicating it, but certainly could when we get to around the next week. Okay, so definitely something to keep an eye on as we roll in. Yeah, you know, week. calling a top in these markets, very difficult uh, as far as selling them. You basically just have to close your eyes and do it, uh, particularly when they're this high. All right. Well, let's jump over to the lean hog market. Mm -hmm. We just saw the story on PED mm -hmm. continuing to affect the market, though we had a, a pullback this week of about $3. We did. We saw the we saw the hog market come down, and it's interesting, you know, to look at this, at the hog market short term and then compare it to what we see long term. Uh, I was asked by a long time DTN customer if I could post my uh, uh, my f what, three to four year cycle chart that goes back into the 90s and if it still holds true, if this type of cycle still holds true in the hogs, then this past June would have been the cycle high and the market would now back off into September. Fundamentally, what's going to cause that? Uh, we haven't seen the same sort of supply and demand su support in the hog market that we've seen in the cattle. So if we start to see the cash market sag a bit, if we start to see demand start to pull back a little bit because of high prices, who knows, uh, that could be the trigger that does send us down into the at first low that, again, would happen this fall. All right. Well, not a whole lot of excitement on this weekend for us, Darren. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, thanks for taking the time to be with us and discuss these markets. All right. Thank you, Mike. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Darren and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in our Market Plus segment online. You'll also find audio podcasts and streaming video of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed, Facebook page, and the rest of our social media outlets exclusively at the Market to Market website. And be sure to join us next week when we'll learn about a photographer who is capturing the changing role of women in agriculture. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.